Good morning, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and cover a little bit today. I'm on my way. It's 9 o'clock in the morning on uh, Monday. I'm down by the water. And I'm getting ready to go see Pops. And I want to do a little bit of... I was going to wait. I kind of wanted to take a day off when I... Monday morning, I pray. Uh, it's my longer prayer time. And I don't like having to... Uh, think about, oh, I'm going to teach or I'm going to speak, which I don't really do a whole lot of preparing, as you can see. But still, I want to let that time be like a prayer time for me. But now it's a little bit later, so I thought, okay, before I go get Pops, I'm going to help him today. And I have a few friends now in that area that I'm going to start, you know, giving some time to. Um, I read Revelation uh, chapter 2, uh, the first few eight or nine verses yesterday. And so I'm going to cover some of the book of Revelation, and I'm going to have a little post with this, and I want you to read through it. Um, I, I posted chapter 1 the other day, and so what we see, and I'm going to show you how it's important for us to read Scripture, and then if over time, many smart, I have a lot of smart friends, uh, scholarly guys, and there are views of scripture that might be true, might not be true. But I've always found it interesting how some of my friends, once they grab hold of a certain view, they almost believe that view to be inspired or scripture itself. And so one of the things I want you to see is uh, whether your view is a futuristic view, most of meaning most people that are futurists or all people that are futurists, look at Revelation more as everything's going to still come to pass right like in the last, right before the return of Christ. And a lot of those views I see as problematic. Uh, the views that the mark of the beast or uh, the uh, prophet, the false prophet, people see actually uh, there'll be a image, a statue that comes to life, computer chips in our bodies, 666 on the, you know, the things that you put, a, none of those views I really hold to, okay? So I want you to see that there's a lot of spiritual realities, there are actual literal things that we will read about in the book of Revelation, but there are a lot of images. So, a little uh, introduction is, the letter was written to seven churches in Asia Minor, <coughs> which is modern day Western Turkey. And there were seven communities of believers in those regions we read about. Smyrna and uh, Ephesus and Pergamon and all these places you're going to read about. And what are the letters that the book of Revelation was written? And they're addressing things about the churches. Now some view the seven churches as seven stages or periods of church history. There's nothing that we read about that says that. If you want to have that view, you can. I would prefer to say we're going to get practical instruction from what Jesus is communicating. Now remember, right in chapter 1, it says it was the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Okay? So... God, the Father, gave this prophetic vision, revelation to the Son. The Son gave it to John through an angel. Okay, angels are messengers. Angels, it says in Hebrews, are ministering spirits sent forth to minister unto us who are heirs of salvation. So, in a simple way, this was revealed to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. And this was a communication. And it's through angels that we see all throughout the book. Now, we have an image. It says, John heard the voice in chapter 1. He turned around to see the voice that was speaking. It was like a trumpet. And we remember when I covered Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4, the Apostle Paul says, The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Okay? Later we're going to read images like that. So, John's having this vision. 
and when he turns around, he sees it's an Im it's a, s a prophetic symbol, and Jesus himself is in the middle of seven golden candlesticks, and in his right hand are seven stars. Okay, what is that? Jesus is in the midst of his churches, and I'll hit a little bit on the seven stars to show you a little bit about how ecclesiology, ch church government, how we impose our view. It's those of you that have been following the videos. I, t I told a little bit about how in the New Testament, the word pastor, uh, we've developed something over time that's really not the biblical definition of what pastor is. And we read the word in English one time in the King James, which is in the book of Ephesians. God has placed some in the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ, until we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man. Now, in the New Testament letters, we don't read the office of a pastor. We don't see it as it's come to be developed over time. Uh, most of the Protestant churches that you and I are familiar with, this is not to condemn anybody. Most of them are organized along the lines of sort of you go to a place where you meet on Sunday. It's more of like a lecture hall. And we have a pastor, you have a pastor, and he preaches. And people see that as a functioning local church. That's really not a biblical definition of local church. Local church would be all the communities of believers in those cities, the letters that were written to in the seven regions there of Asia Minor. Now, how do we know, John, that there are not pastors in the sense of one pastor over each flock? Huh. Because when you read the New Testament, when Paul's writing, these are ways you know. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth or whatever. He's writing directly to the brothers. In, I think it's Philippians, he says to the brethren, but the uh, deacons and bishops as well. But the image you get is, if there was the role that you understand it, like most people understand, it would be a violation of church etiquette for Paul to just speak to them without addressing the pastor. Now I'm mentioning this, not to be critical, but for us to get an understanding. Because in the image that John sees of Jesus, he has seven stars in his hand. And the image, the symbol is revealed to John. It says the seven stars are the messengers or the angels of the seven churches. And many scholars and interpreters will say these were more than likely the pastors of the seven churches. Well, you didn't have pastors like you have today back then. So they superimpose that, you see. What would be a good image of that? I've read this many years, over the years. You can interpret the word uh, messenger or angel in, it could refer to people or to angels. But the book is, right in chapter 1, Jesus sent and signified this vision to John through an angel. And you got a lot of angelic activity in Revelation. So when you see the seven angels in the right hand of Jesus Christ, in the middle of the seven golden candlesticks, you could take it as angels. And it also would solve another difficult passage in chapter 1, which says, and these are the seven spirits of God. And there's a lot of, oh, well, there's seven spirits, there's like heresies over this. Uh, and some scholars say it's the Holy Spirit and his seven manifestations, or it's seven actual spirits from God. And it says in chapter 1, there are the seven spirits before the throne of God, the seven spirits of God. Now, if you just put those two together, being they're in the same chapter, and the book is a whole book of messengers of angels, are there seven spirits of God, John? There's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. Are there any more spirits of God? God made everything. 
Every angel is the spirit of God. Not the Holy Spirit. We are people of God. So those two, you could solve it right there. There's a communication. Seven is real representative. We're going to see cycles of judgment and of sevens all throughout the book. So you could see Jesus in the middle of the seven churches. And he has messages to those seven. And just like the message is being communicated to the Apostle John, sent and signified it by his angel, in a sense, these are messages that Jesus has directly given to these churches. And there's seven angels. The scripture, there's something in Jewish tradition that says the law was given by angels. But yet we read that the law was given to Moses. But yet in Hebrews it also says this. I think it's Hebrews it says... Uh, it was given by angels. Maybe it's in Galatians. Well, what does that mean? God uses angels, which are spirits, ministering spirits, and they work. And, and God uses them. So, Jesus with the seven stars in his right hand, that would not be a good interpretation to say those were seven pastors. Because in the New Testament, the key figures, we know who they are. Um, we know who Paul is, we know who the twelve disciples are, we know the names of key figures. And how strange would it be for these seven churches in Asia Minor to have seven pastors, which would be the main figures in those cities, and nobody knows who their names were. So it's just the messengers or angels probably is the best interpretation, and that resolves the problem of the seven spirits of God. There were seven particular angels administering these messages, okay? So Jesus is communicating. Now, let's get to the message, at least, of the first church, Ephesus. The most uh, prominent individual that was a member of the church of Ephesus, uh, church history tells us a lot of times people say Paul because Paul... Uh, we read about him in Ephesus in the book of Acts that wrote the letter to the Ephesians. But it's John, John the Beloved. John the Apostle is considered uh, one of the most prominent members of that church. And, and they are commended. They are commended because their works were on fire for God. They tried them that said they were apostles and are not and has found them liars. They did a zeal, and they had a lot of good things going for them. But the rebuke they get is this. They have left their first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do your first works. So, one of the warnings to us is, or even God is saying to us, I'm, I'm glad you're doing good works. I'm glad you're communicating. I'm glad you're dealing with false doctrine because they said they were apostles but they were not but he said but I have this against you you have left your first love and then at the end of each message we'll read about in chapter 2 and 3 to the seven churches it's blessed are those who overcome and there's a blessing and it says to the Ephesians they will have a right to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God or the presence of God Later, we're going to read at the end of the book of Revelation, if we do that much, that in the city of God, which is the church, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's the church, the bride of Christ. And in the midst of the city, there was the river of life. And Jesus said in the Gospel of John, those who believe out of their bellies will flow rivers of living water. And it says, This spake he of the Spirit, which they which believe on him should receive, which was still in the future when he said that in John's Gospel, because the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So now we're seeing the Holy Spirit in the church, and those who overcome, those who believe and overcome, we have right to the tree of life. It says also in the book of Revelation, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without, outside of that community, 
or sin, and it gives a list of sins, whoremongers and drunkards and idolaters. So the people, I've had friends over the years that would tell me, maybe they were in active addiction or sleeping around or whatever, a lot of times that's a big one. And they'd say, John, but I just can't understand the Bible. And I would say, you know, God's merciful. But if you're really not walking in righteousness, you're not going to understand it. Because you don't have right to the tree of life. We're going to read about the hidden manna, the bread of life. God reveals things to us in our lives right now when we walk in righteousness. And every day we can have daily bread. I mentioned that in the other video. Uh, every day God gives you daily bread. He communicates to you. If you're walking in His will, if you're walking in righteousness. So the first letter is the first church. The message goes to the Ephesians, to the church at Ephesus, and that's what they're exhorted to do. Remember your first works. Paul said in Corinthians 13, if I have all revelation and prophecy, and I give my body to be burned, and I have all charity, and I give everything, and I do all these things, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. You know, I was talking about the gospel just yesterday or the other day, and how Jesus was doing all these wonderful works. And it says that the Pharisees and the authorities were incensed at him. They wanted to kill him. So, his miracles of raising Lazarus, healing the blind man, none of those things convinced them to become believers because they were sinful. But on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And then he rose from the dead. And his resurrection from the dead wasn't enough to convince them because, it says in the New Testament, the religious leaders, the authorities even knew he rose from the dead. But it was his love. It was his willingness to forgive. So, the church today, this is the first one we'll cover. Rem uh, let's be reminded that we have to return to our first love. And do it the first works, like when we first came to know God. Alright, this is a short one. I'm going to go see Pops. I'll probably upload it later. It's Monday, and I like giving you all the real time. I'll probably interact with different friends today. This day I'll probably be in this area, the west side of town. And I want to encourage you. Uh, when you see this, read the verses, read that Revelation 1. Think about what I mentioned. Go read that. Jesus gave the interpretation himself. The seven stars in his right hand with the seven angels to the churches, okay, of the churches. And that's just a communication means where this is being communicated, which that's what angels are doing. We're going to read a lot about that. In Revelation, It's I don't see it so much in the book of Revelation as a chronological of events that are all going to, certain things happen. Uh, many of the views that are very popular today, you know, rapture happens. We talk about the millennial. Some people see the thousand-year reign mentioned about as a symbolic uh, reign on millennialism. Others take it literally premillennialism. So we'll talk about some of those things. But most of all, don't don't miss the great realities. It says in chapter one, He washed us from our sins in His own blood, and He made us kings and priests unto God and our Father. We will reign on the earth. That's taught in the New Testament letters. That we are risen already. In Ephesians and Romans, Paul te teaches that. We are seated with him, it says in Ephesians, in heavenly places in Christ. We have been raised from the dead, in Romans 6 and Romans 8. We are, we are now kings and priests unto God and our Father. These are present realities that we possess. And, there, and each letter, this is number one, we did the each one to each church, It's there's a promise to the overcomer. And look at that promise. If you overcome, it says in 1 John, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Oh, some people buy my car over there. I'm heading that way. So, whosoever, his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 
uh, in James and in Peter, uh, we begotten again by the Word of God, the seed of God within us. That's how we know we are of Him, because we love one another and we overcome. All right, I want to bless you today. Read that chat, uh, read that passage, and uh, and return to your first love if you if you've lost it. God bless you all.